Last time, I covered the mechanics of using the layer offset in Particle Illusion to eliminate the motion of the camera that filmed the scene. This part of the tutorial covers the animation of the emitter and the additional techniques required to really sell the effect. I also talked about needing patience and determination to complete the project. The first test of your patience and determination was animating the offset. Patience and determination test number two. Now that the camera motion has been accounted for, patiently animating the emitter with determination can begin. To make animating the emitter to follow the ball more efficient, the default keyframe type should be set to curved. Go to View, Preferences, and check the box next to Position Keys Created Curved. Click OK. As with animating the offset, accuracy in setting position keys for the emitter is essential. Zoom in and scroll again. Scrub the clip to get a feel for how the ball moves. Pay particular attention to where there is an abrupt change of speed or direction, such as when it bounces or is kicked by a player. New position keys must be added at those places where the change occurs. Return to the first frame of the clip and click on the particle's object display icon. That turns off the display of the emitter particles just as if you had clicked on the show particles button on the toolbar. Refine the position of the emitter so that it's directly over the ball. I want to take a moment here and make an important distinction in terminology. Although the terms emitter and particles are often used interchangeably when casually talking about particle illusion, they aren't really the same thing. During this tutorial, I will use the term emitter when I'm talking about the thing that you place on the stage and then drag around to make new position keys. Particles are what the emitter emits, and they are the only thing that the audience will see when the output from your particle illusion project is used in your production. Back on task. Right-click the emitter and make sure that curved is checked and connected is unchecked. In a moment, you'll see why it's important to uncheck connected. I'll scrub forward in time to where the ball bounces enough to change its speed or direction. That occurs at frame 11. I'll add a new position key by dragging the emitter to the center of the ball. Notice that a spline control adjustment handle now extends from both of the keyframes. Because the spline control handles may overlap nearby keyframes and the handles for those keyframes, it's a good idea to pull the handles away from the direction of motion before attempting to adjust the emitter's path. It doesn't matter in what direction you pull, because the handles will be moved back later during the adjustment. Right-click on the new keyframe and uncheck Connected. Return to the first frame of the clip and click on the object display icon for the particles to make them visible again. Then click on the object display icon for the emitter to turn off its display. Scrub between the two keyframes and see if the emitter path follows the motion of the ball. Most likely, it won't follow very well at all because you randomly positioned the spline control handles just a moment ago. And, like we do here, you may run into the very interesting problem that the emitted particles are so big that you can't really evaluate the emitter's path relative to the ball. Let's tackle the size problem first. In the Hierarchy window, select Zoom for the emitter. Return to the first frame of the clip and drag the first Zoom data key down and back up in the Graph window. Notice how the emitter changes size relative to the ball. To make working with the emitter in this clip easier, set a value of about 250. Scrub again to see the difference that changing the zoom makes. Turn on the display of the emitter again. Because the ball's motion between bounces is generally a simple parabola, the handles between adjacent keyframes will often end up pointing towards each other with an angle of about 45 degrees up from horizontal for the big bounces and smaller angles for the smaller bounces. So that's a good place to start. Take a deep breath and move the handles. OK, now scrub the clip between the two keyframes. Oops, sorry, you can breathe out now. Adjust both the angle and the length of each handle to refine the emitter's path further. Keep in mind that when the emitter is closer to one keyframe than another, the handle on the closer keyframe will have more influence on the emitter's path than the handle on the other keyframe.
However, an adjustment of the distant keyframes handle will often provide a necessary refinement. You will have to toggle the display of the particles on and off several times to help you make accurate adjustments. Be aware that the emitter won't change its current position along the path as you scrub unless the particles are displayed, but it will respond to the spline control handles while the particles are turned off, which helps a lot. When you think you've got it right, turn off the object display of the emitter so that you can see the path of the particles better. Evaluate and adjust again as necessary. Turn off the display of the particles and turn on the display of the emitter once you are satisfied with the motion between keyframes. I'll scrub ahead to the next bounce that changes the ball's speed or direction noticeably. That occurs at frame 25. Usually you can safely ignore the small bounces that occur while the ball is rolling, which will significantly reduce the number of keyframes that are needed. I can't tell you how happy I was to discover that little tidbit of information. The change that I see at frame 25 that requires a new position key is that the ball has slowed down considerably. Drag the emitter to the new ball position. Notice that a new spline control handle has magically grown out of the previous keyframe. Go ahead and move both new handles out of the way. Now you can see why it's necessary to uncheck connected for a keyframe. Had I left the handles connected, moving the new handle as I did would also have moved the handle sticking out of the other side of the keyframe. The uh, same handle that was carefully positioned just minutes ago. There have been a few occasions where I left handles connected in the past and I did not notice the movement of the connected handle in time to use undo. I won't call the result a disaster, but it was bad enough that my reaction was definitely not suitable for polite company. Right click the new position key and uncheck connected. Adjust the facing handles as before and then evaluate the particle motion with the emitter display turned off. While you adjust the handles, if you find yourself thinking, more patience, just a little more patience and I'll get this, then you are probably doing things just right. If, instead, you start tearing out large chunks of hair from your head, or if you decide to do that naked street thing I talked about before, then you may want to revisit the beginning of this section and try again. Continue adding position keys like this until the ball leaves the video frame near the end of the clip. I've got a special technique for use with a disappearing ball. I want to show you what happens if the layer offset is not animated and you just jump right in animating the emitter. Recall that our first offset position key was at frame 45, one frame before we noticed a change in the motion of the camera. So the position keys for the emitter at or before frame 46 should be okay. I'll scrub the clip and we can check out that theory. Yep, they're all okay. Now, let's see where the next emitter position key should be placed based on the motion of the soccer ball. It looks like frame 53 is a good choice because that's where the ball bounces. But look where our other existing keyframes for the emitter are on the stage. We would have to set a new position key to the left of the existing keyframes. I'll add the new keyframe anyway and then turn on the particles so that you can see what it would look like to the audience. Not a pretty sight, is it? Because there is no offset, we have ended up with the illusion that the ball has emitted particles from a point that it hasn't even reached yet. Let's get back to animating the emitter with the layer offset properly animated. I've skipped ahead in time to where all of the position keys have been added except the last one. So what needs to be done when the ball leaves the video frame? Recall that the motion of the ball is parabolic between bounces and we can use that fact to add the last position key for the emitter's animation. 
Scroll the stage to the left until it's at least halfway out of view. Scrub the clip backwards to the point where the ball bounces for the last time at frame 79. Now scrub forward and backward between frame 79 and the end of the clip to get a feel for the ball's flight path. Now you get to be seer and prognosticator. Predict the point where the ball would have landed on the particle illusion stage had the clip continued past frame 86. And consider this, you not only have to estimate where it will land, you have to estimate at what frame that landing would have occurred had the clip continued. Use the motion of the ball between frame 70 and 79 to predict what kind of flight path you would expect between frame 79 and the end of the clip. I predict that the ball would have bounced again at about frame 88. Ah, who am I kidding? Had you going, didn't I? Once the ball moves out of sight in the video clip, you can pick almost any frame and any position to set the last position key. Adjusting the spline handles on the last two keyframes will overcome any guessing errors on your part. You really should try to make an accurate guess as to the ball's time and place of landing, but it's not critical. It'll just make adjusting the handles a lot easier. Now that animating the motion of the emitter is finished, let's examine the size of the emitter. I changed its zoom level earlier to assist with placing position keys, but now we need to evaluate the emitter's size with a different goal in mind. First, we need to look at the ball as it originally appeared in the clip. Turn off the object display of both the emitter and the particles. Now scrub the clip. As the ball moves in the frame, the audience's perspective is that it sometimes moves closer to them and sometimes moves farther away. By animating the zoom property of the emitter, you can simulate the movement of the emitter along the z-axis so that the size of the emitter matches the apparent size of the ball. In the hierarchy window, select zoom for the emitter. Return to the first frame of the clip and then scrub ahead to frame 10. The ball appears to be smaller. Turn on the display of the emitter and the particles. Click in the graph window to create a new data key and drag it down to about 180. Scrub through the rest of the clip. The 180 value seems to do the job until about frame 70. I'll set a data key there and another at the end of the clip with a value of 280 to account for the apparent change in the size of the ball during the last few frames. Now zoom the stage to fit the window and scrub to frame 75. Notice how the ball is near the goalpost, but we still have emitted particles floating around back where the emitter first started emitting. I don't like the way that looks, so I'll shorten the life of the trail particle type. Click on the life property of the trail particle type. I'll adjust its value in the graph window from the current 18 down to about 9. That gets me the look I want. I could have adjusted the life of the entire emitter, but I like what the glow particle types are doing, and, as a matter of habit, I targeted my correction to the specific particle type that was causing the problem. When I changed the zoom level earlier, I did it for the entire emitter so that everything would remain in proportion. I know, it's a subtle difference, but for a compulsive editor like me, it seems significant. Your mileage may vary. The emitter is ready to export. Zoom out to 100%. Turn off the background image by clicking on its object display icon. Return to the first frame and click on the red Save Output button in the toolbar. I almost always export my emitters as PNG image sequences. They're small, lossless, and fast to encode. Give the image sequence a name. I'll use Ball Trails. And select PNG files from the Save As Type drop-down list. Click Save and you'll see the Output Options dialog. Notice also that Particle Illusion has automatically hidden all of the panels necessary to make room for the stage to be shown completely at full scale.
make sure that single frame only is unchecked and that the start and end frame numbers are correct. Do not enable compression. Check the save alpha box and ensure that remove black background from RGB channels is checked. Click OK and wait for the sequence to render. Once again, I have gone on longer than I anticipated, so I'll end part two of this tutorial here. Part three will land us back in After Effects, where we will composite the exported emitter with the original DV footage and then put things in their proper perspective.